So honored to be with a man you might know as Supernova or Nova. You may know him as Hollywood Nova. You may know him as Simon Dean. It's Mike Bucci. Mike, welcome to Under the Ring Pro Wrestling Conversation. So glad you're here with me today. Phil, what's up, buddy? Thanks for having me. Uh, I was honored when you when you got a hold of Donnie B and he reached out and asked. Uh, I don't do a whole lot of these anymore. Uh, I'm wrapping it up on December 3rd, so I'm sure I'll stick around every now and then. But uh, for this one, fellow Jersey guy, I had to say yes. So... So we'll start with what you've got going on. December 3rd, uh, Barnabas Arena, Tom's River, New Jersey. There's a big pro wrestling card going on, appearances by Sting and Jerry the King Lawler and Sergeant Slaughter. But this night is also billed as your last match. Why now, and what's your thought process as you head into this uh, night? Uh, thanks, Phil. Obviously, I, 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 you have to come that night too, Phil. But uh, this one... Long story, I mean, I'm not going to get the whole background, but 19, I started in 1992, late 91, 92, sometimes I forget. It's been 30 years. I started in Ocean County in Bricktown, New Jersey at Iron Mike Sharp's Professional Wrestling School. Iron Mike is an old-time veteran. If you guys didn't know who he is, look him up. Uh, he was my original trainer. Start, so I started 30 years ago. I've been out of full-time wrestling now for over a decade. Uh, I'm a dad, first and foremost. I have a full-time job in the finance industry. Do a lot of board and committee work, done some acting. Uh, I stay pretty busy. Uh, so wrestling has been secondary for a long time. My brother, Donnie B, Don Bucci, uh, him and his promoter uh, cohorts, Sean McHugh and Chad Minnis, they got together and they had been wanting to do a major event for years. They did one last year in Lacey, huge success. Uh, but I know he had his eye on the, we used to call it the Rataka Center. But the St. Barnabas Arena, he's had his eye on that for years. So he finally got the green light to do it. It's in conjunction. They're raising a lot of money for the 200 Club. They do a lot of work with the fallen officers, first responders, EMT, stuff like that. So it's an awesome cause. I think Sean's the president of the 200 Club. So once they got on board, it was a no-brainer. Uh, they started putting the card together and talking about it. And I never wanted to be one of those guys to do like a last official thing. I just didn't feel like I was ever that big enough or anything to do something like that. I didn't think anybody would care. So, but once he started talking about it, and I realized that for the fans in Ocean County, Monmouth County, in New Jersey, if they followed me all the way from Mike's Sharps to ECW to WWE and everywhere in between, I was like, you know what, man, if, if, if you might be onto something, because Donnie brought it up and thought of the idea. And I was like, you know, yeah, if there's some finality to it. Let's put an exclamation point on it. I started in Ocean County. Let's end in Ocean County. There'll be friends, family, fans. I mean, there's going to be people that night that I haven't seen in 20 years. Everybody from Michael Bryan, Northeast wrestling owner, the legendary Dino Santa from Pennsylvania. I mean, old guys I broke in with. One of the guys who I had my first ever match with, the Nomad. He's going to be – I mean, just so – the guy who got me into wrestling, this guy, Rich Long, Mr. High Voltage. I mean, there's people from my past over like a 30-year career that are going to be there. It, it's not a Nova retirement show. I did not want it to be called that. This is an event for the 200 Club, St. Barnabas Arena. Going to be the largest show ever to hit Ocean County. Uh, I'm flattered that Sting is going to be there and Jerry Lawler. It's for the folks of Ocean County to come out and see this. So I don't think there's any ever, ever been anything like this in that area. So that's what I'm mostly psyched for. Sounds tremendous. And just, uh, w what's it going to be like for you to getting back in, get, getting back in the ring again? How long has it been? And, uh, wh what can you tell me about what you're going to be doing? Man, that's a great, a great thing, Phil. I, uh, whew, I've done three events in the past three years. I've done two shows last year in, uh, Alaska for the wrestle pro group. Kevin Matthews, Pat Buck, and the guys. And then I did Donnie B's event last August in Lacey with Meany on both of those shows. We did BWO. Uh, for me, it's I don't want to say it's bittersweet. It's not. It's just a nice finality to it. It's more for the fans and my family and friends that are going to come out for the night. Uh, I've been stretching a lot more, cutting weight a little bit. I've been working with my guy Pasha, who owns uh, Macroman Nutrition here in the Kentucky Annie area. He's the man. Uh, my coach, Drew Donaldson, down in Florida helping me prep a little bit uh i just turned 50 back in june so you're, you're not probably going to see the 1996 nova from ecw the innovator guy flying all over the place i don't think that's going to happen but uh <laughs> that night it's going to be myself uh two partners from my past frankie kazarian who was my partner in a team called evolution out in upw 
after ECW closed, I was out there with the legendary Rick Bassman and his crew, and I teamed up with Frankie for Evolution. And then when I went to Ohio Valley Wrestling, I was paired up with a gentleman named Aaron the Idol Stevens, also known as Damian Sandow. Uh, he's my other partner that night. And we're going to take on Matt Cardona, uh, Zach Ryder, if you want to call him that, Brian Myers, and Pat Buck. It's three guys who I've – everybody in that match has either been – a partner of mine, a student of mine, a protege of mine, like there's a connection to me. So it's kind of put together that way. They want to come in and kind of spoil the evening, I think, for their own resumes. But uh, I don't know, man. I think I got one kryptonite crunch left in me, at least one. So somebody might be eating one that night. Who knows? Very nice. And you did mention before you said something about me being from New Jersey. I'll just well, reiterate right now. I, I do work with the folks in New Jersey, Asbury and Bergen. I'm actually a Long Island guy who lives in Poughkeepsie, and I'm actually in White Plains right now of all places. Okay. So all sorts of Northeast connections. Uh, but I know like of at least most of the people you just mentioned. So that's The Mid-Hudson Civic Center, Poughkeepsie, New York. Been there many times. Michael Bryan ran his events there. Yeah, that's Mike. Mike was one of the first promoters ever to pay me a hundred dollars for one night. Wow! And I forget as this is going twenty five years back, Mid Hudson Civic Center. Mike, I think it was one hundred and fifty dollars he paid me, and I thought I was a millionaire. I, but I just, you know, I just Mike, saw him like two weeks ago. <laughs> Mike's awesome. Yeah, White Plains been there a million times, uh, all over New York. So uh, sweet. You, you mentioned Iron Mike Sharp before, and he was on my list of people to ask you about because he was such a presence and such a character. I spoke to Crowbar a few weeks ago, and he shared some stories about training oh, yeah. with uh, Iron Mike Sharp as well. What what was it like uh, breaking in under him? It was cool. First of all, Crowbar, great guy. I'm very proud of the life that Devin made for himself outside of wrestling. Uh, he did not fall, and we could probably talk about this later, fall victim of like the curse where so many guys after the, after the bell rings that doesn't go well for them. Devin is the opposite. He's done great. Uh, Mike was awesome, man. Mike was billed as Canada's greatest athlete. He was a big, burly dude. They had that old man vet thing going on. Mike didn't get in the ring and teach us tackle drop down, Frankensteiner, high spot, all that. Mike was, you know, man, he would he would go in the ring and he'd have the oil on. He'd put the forearm band on every now and all that stuff. And he taught us respect. What was cool about Mike, when, we, when I first broke in, and was doing independent shows and going up and doing the the extra work for WWF back in the day on Superstars Wrestling Challenge. Like that's how you got your break. Uh, basically, when we dropped Mike's name, Mike was the one when we would tell him that we were trained by Mike Sharp that they would love it. I mean, you go up there and tell Pat Patterson and Chief J and Arnold Scolan and though and Arnie, they would t Arnold Scolan the guys. You tell them they're trained by Mike Tony Gurria. You didn't you didn't need to tell them anything else. So Mike, uh, we miss Mike. That crew that went to Mike Sharps, myself, Donnie B, Rick Ratchet, Rocco Dorsey, Lupus, CC, all of us. Uh, we were all together and all of us trained there every night. We were there three or four nights a week. We would break from training. We'd go eat at Denny's and hang out and come back to the school at 12 o'clock midnight. And Mike would be in there doing like plyometric exercises and warm ups. <laughs> and it was just weird, odd, man. <laughs> he would be there all night. But uh, he, he was a respected veteran. Everybody liked Mike. Uh, he was a legendary guy. I mean, he was fantastic. And I made a lot of friends with that. It well, changed my life. I mean, I was going to college to get a math degree and didn't know what I was really going to do. A buddy of mine, Rich Lom, was going to Mike's school to train to be a wrestler. And he invited me to go watch. So we would watch. And uh, about a month into it, Mike just kept asking me, hey, you want to go and try it out? And I tried it. And. I figured it would be like baseball league, bowling league, softball league, something to do on the side to have fun with. But I certainly didn't imagine 30 years later I'd be talking to Phil Strum, talking about my retirement <laughs> at the Rataka Center. You know, I've been in WrestleMania as I wrestled in Tokyo. I've been around the world, and that's crazy that that journey started at Mike Sharps. That's great. You were always one of my favorite guys to watch in ECW. Thanks, man. What was what was it like the first time you made contact with them? And what's it like the first time you stepped foot in ECW? Great question. So to this day, it was probably – that was scarier for me than it was walking out the ring at WrestleMania in Los Angeles. It was. Um, I, I won't go too much in depth, but I was on an independent show in New Jersey. Uh, the main event was Raven versus, I think, Mikey. ECW was just starting to explode a little bit. I was buddies with Stevie. So I was on this independent show doing my whole superhero act. And the intermission, 
you know, I would come out running and do cartwheels with the kids and I had the cape and the makeup and all that stuff. And at intermission, one of the t-shirt girls pulled me over and said, hey, Scotty wants to talk to you. I said, Scotty? She's like, yeah, Raven. I said, oh, wow, okay, cool. So he pulls me aside, starts talking to me, tells me that he loved my act. He's like, what is this, like Adam West Batman? I said, yeah, it's a corny superhero thing. So he thought it was cool, wanted me to give him a tape of just my ring entrances, like running to the ring with the kids and cart with They didn't care about the matches. So I was like, okay. So Scotty was a uh, DJ at a gentleman's establishment. So imagine me putting this tape together and having to go to a place called Moon Dancers in Philadelphia to drop this <laughs> tape off for him. And we did. And sure enough, like a couple days later, I get home from work and uh, my mom was like, hey, there's a guy named Raven on the tele on the answer machine for you. <laughs> so I play it and he's like, hey, kid, uh, you know, uh, I showed your tape to Tommy and Taz and they really loved it, man. You know, come on down. You know, what Scotty was doing at the time, he was building the original flock. Right. He had Stevie in it and he had me in it, which he told me about. He's like, you'd be, the per you'd be the perfect guy to be in the flock with us, man. So, like, he was using us as athletic camouflage to build his act and all that and use us as, like, chess pieces and stuff. It was brilliant. And so I, I, he, he invited me to go down to the arena. And ECW had that – man, when it for, I can't explain it, Phil. If you went, you saw it. But there was, like, an underground kumite, like, fight club vibe to it. That's the best way I can describe it. And it was, like, an underground cult thing. So I had only been to a couple shows. Stevie got us tickets and stuff. And so I go, and I'll never forget. It was Ronnie Lang from Atlas who I walked up to, and I said, hey, can you go in the back and tell Scotty that Nova's here to see him? And Ronnie popped his head out of that, that mythical, magical curtain of the ECW entranceway and, like, waited for me to come back. And I walked in the back, and the first one I ran into was Beulah and then Tommy. Tommy handed me a hot dog and said, hey, Scotty wants to be a part of his act, man. Here's your first payday, and handed me a hot dog. And I had known Tommy from several independent shows. And uh, I mean, to say the rest is history, but I just kept going to the shows and I, I, I didn't even get paid for the first couple months. And I was getting $25 here, $50 there. And then next thing you know, we're the biggest telling, selling t-shirt in the history of the company with BWO. And it just exploded from there. But I love ECW. I loved every a part of it. I didn't, I didn't make millions from ECW. You guys all know the stories, but we were all there together on a weekly basis. We all had fun. We, we were all learning as we went along. No, everybody, everybody got along. It was a good time, man. I can't explain it. If you weren't there, it's just hard to explain what it was like to other people because there's no other wrestling locker room that's ever been like that, or I think, or uh, there'll never be another one like it again. There's no way. Not with the climate the way it is today. It's just impossible. Yeah, I agree. I with can't that. even I, tell I, all the stories. I had the I opportunity heard. to go one uh, one time to an original ECW event. It was actually the last one they did in Poughkeepsie, which I was in college at the time. And oh, it was okay. Scott Scott Hall came out, uh, wrestled Big Sal. Yep, and then he wrestled Just Incredible in the main event. They, he opened and closed the show. We didn't even know Scott was there. We're all sitting in the back just doing our thing. Next thing we turn around, he came with PJ because right. he was friends with PJ. And when he came in, uh. I guess he wanted to show the because you know Scott got a bad rap for whatever reason, you know the click thing and all that. I guess, but people were healing the guy out, and uh, he came in as like, "Give me the biggest guy you got here," and he put over Sal Graziano clean in the middle of the ring. Yeah, that was so, such. I mean, it was such such a fun atmosphere to be in, and I've never quite experienced anything like it ever again as a fan. I've been been to great wrestling shows, but just the absolute, just the atmosphere itself, just like they always say the fan is like a whole other character. And it, it really yeah, it was, was like true. Rocky Horror Picture, I guess. That's yeah. what, if you've if you done Rocky Horror Picture yeah. or live interactive sporting events, I mean, the first time I went to ECW and like John Bailey, the hat guy, the Hawaiian shirt guy was sitting in the front row before the show started. The cr there was like a hush over the crowd. There was like 1500 people in the crowd. He reached in his Hawaiian t-shirt and pulled out the straw hat and the place went insane. That's so fun. And as original sign guy was there. Mike Johnson, Tony Lewis, the uh, Dreads, uh, Faith No More guy, Lenny. That's what they called him. All the boys were there. They're all going to be at the show on December 3rd, a lot of them, by the way. Man. But uh, the ECW crowd, to me, they sh if there was an ECW Hall of Fame, they would be in it, the crowd. Yeah. Because they made it just as much. You know, when they, the, I'll tell you, I said, Phil, I don't want to go into a tangent. I will never forget as, until they put me in the ground. When Super Crazy wrestled Tajiri the first time, and Tajiri was in the corner, and Super Crazy went to the second rope and started doing the 10 punch spot in the corner, and the ECW crowd chanted, Uno, dos, tres. I literally 
the look on everybody's face in the locker room was out of this world, man. It was the first time I saw Japanese streamers being thrown into a crowd live. I mean, they were just, they were ahead of her time, man. They were great. I love the ECW fans. Loved them. So fun. You you have such a unique style, and I was kind of wondering what influenced it. You were a guy, in my opinion, the only other guy on TV kind of at the time doing similar things to you was probably Chris Canyon, uh, always kind of with a new spin on something that people maybe hadn't seen in North America before with the way you're doing things. Were, were you watching tapes back then? What What kind of influenced kind of what became the Nova style? I watched everything, and thanks for that, man. Here's a little known fact, too. Me and Chris, we were actually great friends. I love Chris. I still mourn his passing to this day. It's a little, it's a, it's a sore spot with me because I just wish that myself and a bunch of other guys could have done more for him. Uh, but we used to talk a lot. I mean, he started in Northeast Indy, so we ran into each other a lot. We followed each other's careers through WCW, ECW. We compare notes. But for me, I was never going to be the biggest, strongest, fastest, anything like that. I wasn't a shooter. Uh, I, I needed something to stand out. So I would spend hours and hours just training and working, and I would see something on a tape or I'd see something on TV and say, hey, let me put a twist on this. Let me do this a little bit differently. And for everything that the fans saw that worked, there were dozens of other things that didn't. And I take a lot of pride. I was talking about this with, with, with Sandow and Frankie, actually, not too long ago, that if you look at guys like – I'm going back 25 years – if you go back and look at some of the ECW matches from 25 years ago, myself, Kid Cash, Super Crazy, Little Guido, Tajiri, I don't want to leave anybody out, but a lot of those guys, and then it morphed into a degree like some of the X Division stuff, and I'm going 20, 25 years back, and put that against some of the stuff you see on like AEW today, or some of the, I don't know, the faster pace, like athletic type wrestling stuff, There was this is revolutionary stuff we were doing in the mid-90s. The cruiserweights at WCW, I'll throw in like three count and Helms, Canyon. Like we really, I don't know, man, a lot of us weren't super heavyweights. So we had to get on our work and our style. And we kind of created that whole next level, like the young bucks, like they adopted a lot of what we did. A lot of these guys, they took what we did and brought it to another level. You know, like the Lucha Brothers, like I said, the Bucks, a bunch of these guys now are, are t took what we did and just made it better. And it's bigger, stronger, faster. But it, you know, I like to think that there, there, I've definitely had a lot of people reach out over the years and said like I was their favorite wrestler, the most innovative guys in the business. Yeah. And uh, I'm always flattered by that because I never, I never thought it was anything special. I just wanted to be different. So one of the most memorable things you did in your career, you mentioned earlier, was the BWO. I know you guys had parodied other wrestlers. What was the creative process like with Stevie Richards and the Blue Meanie as you guys were having fun and, and the fans seemed like they were having fun with it too? Yeah, it was awesome, man. I mean, I knew Stevie from Mike Sharps. I met Stevie, and I don't want to dime him out here, but when his original name was Stud Boy Steve Richards. <laughs> uh, when he used to come to ECW, I love Stevie. Uh, we were just joking about this not too long ago. The fact that... The BWO still has a legacy like 25 years later is nuts. We were in the Retromania game that came out a year and a half ago. We did licensing deals. We have a cello figure coming out next year. We just signed another licensing thing. Meanie said this to me not too long ago. He said, hey, do you think it's crazy that the WWE could actually put the BWO in the Hall of Fame one day? <laughs> and I said, as crazy as that sounds, I don't think you can tell the full story of ECW without talking about the BWO. Like, you have to talk about, of course, Sandman, Sabu, Raven, Dreamer, Taz, all those guys. But can you tell the complete story of the extreme champions in wrestling without talking about three guys who started a movement? And if you understood it, you got it. Some people used to crap on, oh, it's just a stupid parody of the NW. Like, they didn't understand it. Mm. There was three misfit guys that were thrown together, and we did the parody with taste. We made it our own. And we became like the largest selling t-shirt in the history of the company. So, I mean, we had done Kiss. We did a bunch of parodies. I remember when we did Kiss and we came back from that and then the place was going nuts. And I want to say it was maybe Bubba that said to us, man, you know, you guys got to like do something even bigger than that. You should try the NWO one day. We had already been talking about something bigger. So we just started talking about parts and divvying it up. And next thing I know, it's Big Stevie Cool. It's the blue guy and I'm Hollywood Nova. And I went home and I, I knew we were going to debut it in November to remember. 96 and uh i remember sitting home in my basement making the bwo signs and putting the weight belt together and doing this stuff and it was always supposed to be like a one-off and i remember us doing it and it got such a reaction i think we made 
like a hundred or something shirts, the BWO shirts we had. I think Jeff Jones and a printing company course, somebody helped us out with those, getting those done for that initial night. So after we debuted, it was like midway through the show, we put the shirts on the table and we came back and I think Paul said, hey, bring the BWO stuff next week. And we're like, why? He goes, you guys sold every single shirt you had. So that's how we knew we had something. But uh, we were on the WWE's Greatest Factions DVD. Uh, when we do the cons together, we usually have one of the longest lines anywhere because it's hard to get all three of us together. Uh, but it just goes to show you, you never know what's going to get over. You never know what's going to hit. So you can't poo-poo any idea completely because you just never know. Yeah. So you ended up working in WWE and in OVW from, I think it was 2002 to 2007 in various roles. You had the Simon Dean character. And I'd also be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to my friend Louis D, who was actually the person eating the turkey leg oh, yeah. in the Simon D video. He told me to mention himself. So. Big Lou. Yeah, I've known him for a little bit. Um, you were in talent relations and on the creative side of things. What was it like for you getting used to things in the WWE environment? What did you learn and did it challenge you in different ways than other things that you did in your career? Uh, uh, that's a great question, Phil. Big, big shout out to Lou. A bit, Big Lou was awesome. He was such a good sport. It was such a pleasure to do the Simon Dean videos with him. If you were a fan of Simon Dean, though, do yourself a favor and go look up on YouTube. Go look up Simon Dean Bite This. There used to be a WWE like, behind the scenes web show called Bite This. And there's two, <laughs> part one and part two that I did. Lou is in part two. Uh, some of the best work I ever did, but that's a little nugget for you there. Um, I don't think I would have ever had a career in WWE if it wasn't for the time I spent in OBW. Danny, Jimmy, Rip Rogers, the guys, Dr. Tom, really working with me down there. Nova wrestled really hard, but Simon Dean learned how to work smart. Hmm. And I had the ability at a time in my life after getting out of OBW and going up there and working with the agents too, working with Dean Malenko and Fit and Arn and all those guys and Johnny Ace. Just putting all that together and developing like my overall Simon Dean style and character, I guess, there's no way I would have pulled that off if I didn't go there first. So if I went right from ECW to WBF, which had been talked about for a minute, <clears throat> there was a couple ideas that were tossed around that never happened, but I was very thankful for my time in, o in OVW. I got to learn how to write TV. I was writing some TV every now and then. I was booking some house shows. I was the agent on the, the house show when Jimmy didn't want to go. Uh, I was a go-to guy. And it was great, man. They treated me with respect. I loved every minute of it. It it showed me to to me that I belonged. Uh, going from ECW, you know, it's a smaller company, it's a regional thing, but then going to play in the major league, so to speak, was was life changing. And then you know, walking out into RAW for the first time was the validation. <laughs> you know, you get to say to yourself, "Holy cow, I did it!" Seeing that first action figure on the shelf from the guys is nuts. But I learned business acumen and being regimented and structured and it also taught me that anything's possible, right? I mean, my mom and dad were normal people from Tom's of New Jersey. My dad had been gone for a long time, about 10 years, but uh, he had his own garage door company. He was a normal guy. My mom was a normal stay-at-home mom, and I made it to the WBE. Like, how's that even possible, right? So I wasn't 6'6". I wasn't 300 pounds. I wasn't a second-generation guy. I just tried to make the right decisions when I could, and I would try to make myself invaluable. Not valuable. I tried to make myself invaluable, whatever role they needed me to play. And so. you brought you brought something different to the table, and that's it's yeah. That's Simon really Dean great. was my creation, one hundred percent. I mean, they had zero input into any of that from the fitness stuff. The name's the only thing they did because I wanted originally. Here's a, here's a tidbit for you. I was originally going to be called Sunny Slade. That's what <laughs> I wanted to be, and I was going to have Sunny Slade's Super System of Self Help and Supplements, and uh, I was going to don't delay, call today. I was doing the whole thing, and uh, I was basically I've been in OBW for two years at that point, and I wanted to get out. Johnny Ace <laughs> told me, look, you got to come up with an idea because you're going to sit with Vince. He's going to come down and see all this. So long story short, I had a meeting with him beforehand. They came down. The writers came down one day. Nobody knew I was going to do it. I had the jumpsuit on, the wristwatch, the gym bag, all of it. And I went and wrestled a match against one of the guys that day, the final match of the day, because I figured they're either going to fire me or they're going to give me a chance. And at the end of the day, Vince McMahon pulled me aside. He said, that was absolutely fantastic. And I, when he walked out, I'm like, oh, my God, I did it. <laughs> and then like, two weeks later, I'm in Connecticut filming the videos. So it just goes to show you there's no bad idea. The worst yeah. idea you can have is I can do whatever you want me to do. Uh, let, me, let me know what you guys – that's that's not an idea. That's just saying you're you're willing to be a hand, right? which is fine. 
but you have, they have to figure out a way to make money with you. Or the one that you keep in your head and don't share with anybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that happens too every now and then. I mean, look, I wanted to be a, a – my original – before Simon Dean, I wanted to be a guy who was like a, like Johnny Cage from Mortal Kombat. In the mm-hmm. middle of my matches, I was going to take like selfies with a, with a fell on the side. I was going to have advertisements like on my tights and sponsorships after the match. And, you know, man, I can't believe I won that match. Thank, thank God for this energy drink and all that kind of stuff. And – I remember giving that idea around and they didn't do anything with it. It kind of transformed itself over the years. But uh, Simon Dean was just a natural extension. I was ISSA certified. I knew training. I was in a working out and I kind of talked fast, like the whole New Jersey Northeast kind of slick vibe a little bit. So it was just, it was just going from putting on workout clothes to putting on a jumpsuit to go stand in the ring. Like there was, I didn't have to transform in anything. I didn't play a character. I just was myself just dressed in a purple jumpsuit. As somebody who evaluated talent in wrestling, what were you looking for when you were watching an unsigned talent? And has what WWE looks for in talent evolved? Kind of what makes it to TV? Has that evolved? What do you, how do you kind of see it now with them? I, I, that's a good question. I always pride myself on talent. I hired, <laughs> uh, my first official hire was Kofi Kingston. Uh, I hired Santino Morella. I hired Drew McIntyre, Sheamus. Uh, I'm not getting into list. There's a lot of guys, uh, a lot of people I gave chances to. We got them in there. Uh, I would look for guys who just stood out a little bit and guys who wanted to get something done, guys who wanted to actually give this a shot. And I like the people, and this is going back <coughs> a long time, 15 years plus. I My biggest thing was, what are you doing currently? to help your cause to become a WWE superstar. It was always a little bit weird to me when someone would say, man, this is my whole, this is my dream. This is all I ever wanted to do. And they're like 28 years old and they never went to a wrestling school that might've been five miles from their house. They didn't even have a friend named Jim, let alone go to one. Like it just was weird to me. So I looked for guys who had a little bit of sweat or girls uh, who had some sweat equity, who wanted to do this and uh, they gave it a shot. Now, that being said, the business has changed. You have to change with it. I have no problem with what the WB does now because if they throw out 20, 30, or 40 NIL deals a year and they bit those people in the system and they give them six months, they give them nine months, are they progressing? Does this person have it? Guess what? If they don't feel they have it and they give up on them after six months or a year, and then that person maybe goes to the indies or does something and, and progresses in his career or just keeps trying. And then they get a second chance or a third. Who knows? Or they never get seen again. But if the WB just gets like one or two super mega superstars out of that, it's well worth it. Yeah. So they're taking people who are athletes and who have shown they can be trained because they've been somewhat successful in the athletic thing they're doing. And they're going to te- try to teach them pro wrestling. They might not necessarily have been a lifelong fan, but – at this point, it's a little bit easier to get signed. And I, I say this to all the indie guys out there because I don't want to, you know, don't give up hope, man. Mm-hmm. T- c- talent rises, bro, and, and tides change. So if you got the goods, one way or the other, they will discover you. Don't believe me? Go ask Pat Buck. Nobody in the history of my career being around them ever worked harder to try to get a deal than Pat Buck. Now, he didn't make it as a national talent as television, but you know what? He aged in several of the matches of the last WrestleMania. Yeah, I think he did the main event, actually. Yeah, he did pretty good for himself. <laughs> and then he wasn't even released for 24 hours, and AEW couldn't wait to get a hold of him. Yeah. <laughs> so what today is, I would say, is if you're an indie guy, keep going, keep your head up, keep trying, but don't begrudge somebody who's coming in. Like I remember when Matt Capitelli and John Hedigan had won Tough Enough. Neither one of them had spent years in wrestling schools before they came to OBW. And when they came down, and God rest Matt Capitelli's soul, the, the finest human being I ever met, but, uh, you know, when they first came to OBW, they were married to myself and Aaron Stevens for like six months. And it was our job to get them up to speed and teach them the business and, and try to get them moving. We could have guzzled them every night and beat them in four minutes. But next thing you know, within a matter of a month, they're doing 20-minute tag team matches every night. And they look incredible against us. Yeah. So I never – I would tell a talent today, don't be frustrated for your lack of your position right now. If your time comes, it comes. If not, do the best you can. This is a, a work sport controlled by others. You can control your attitude. You can control your look, your matches as much as you can and what you put into it. But you can't. there's so many variables you can't control in this. 
So you can't get bent out of shape about it, man. I, I've been there, guys and gals. Trust me. You know, you want more. You want to achieve more. You know you have so much more to offer, and, and I get it. But <laughs> in professional wrestling, the best way I can describe it, you're an artist, right? And sometimes you get to paint with oils. Sometimes you got to paint with the watercolors. Sometimes you get some latex, or sometimes you get some spray paint. You're still an artist. You might not be painting a Van Gogh, you might be doing a finger paint, but it, it depends on the art gallery owner and what he wants to see from you. So, interesting. So we're gonna move to, on to something we call the three count now. It's gonna be three yeah. quick questions and your answers. Which persona of yours do you think had the best connection, you had the best connection with? <coughs> Let me restart that question entirely yeah. because I didn't word that well at all. <laughs> which persona of yours did you think you had the best connection with and which one do you think resonated best with the fans? I think the fan base, the diehard fan base loved Nova because they saw me come from a goofball running around Raven at ringside to on the last pay-per-view, I got one of the best reactions of the night. When I came out and said, and, you know, beat up Chris Hamrick and all, I love Hamrick too. But <laughs> I think the fans saw my journey from underneath guy to legitimate main event guy in ECW. Uh, if we didn't go out of business, myself and CW Anderson would have traded the television title for a bit. And I think I could have pulled it off. I think I could have been ECW heavyweight champion one day. I really do. Uh, it didn't work out that way. Personally, I connected with Simon Dean more because Simon Dean wasn't a gimmick. I mean, it literally. I created all my own promos. I never got a script. I never ran anything by anybody. I freewheeled all my own stuff. I never memorized anything. And it, I literally would be in the back finishing a protein shake and just, hey, <laughs> and just as soon as me, just walk out the curtain and do it and just come right back and continue what I was doing. There was no flip switch, switch flip, none of that. It was just, but yeah, the fans, I think they like, they love Nova and, uh, the, the, the true diehard fans kind of hated Simon Dean. They were like, oh, my God, this goes against everything you were, and I get it. But I loved being Simon. There was nothing better, man. When I wrestled like Matt Hardy or Bob Holly or any of the, the – Benoit, any of the guys, Jericho, Ray, and we'd be in the ring, and eight minutes in, you get a, you know hit them with something and try to roll them up and count two, and they would kick out, and the whole crowd would, ooh. Man, I wouldn't trade that for anything. Outstanding. Uh, so you spent a lot of time in OVW, as we mentioned. Who in your time there was blatantly obvious that they would be like a huge success? And is there anyone there who surprised you either positively or negatively when you were there? John Cena. I knew John from California at UPW when he was a prototype. My first night in OVW, I beat John <laughs> for the OVW title. John's career really went downhill from there, didn't it? <laughs> but, uh, you knew to be around John, he was going to pull off something and be good. Uh, on day one of meeting Matt Morgan, mm -hmm. I knew Matt had it. Matt's introduction to me, he was staying at the same efficiency motel that I was. I went to the front desk to check in, and they said that my buddy in room eight was stinking up the hotel because he was eating so much tuna fish. And I knocked on Matt Morgan's door, and he opened it up, and he was eating tuna fish raw out of a can. And he was one of the biggest people I've met in my life. But Matt had the charisma. He could talk. I knew he was going to do great. Uh, as far as, I don't know about disappointments, man, because it's such a roll of the dice. It is. Yeah. But I guess somebody, somebody who you really liked, who you thought maybe like could have been a, you know, Paul Burchill. Hands yeah, down. Paul I always Burchel. liked him. Yeah. Paul Burchill was one of my guys. He was my travel partner. At one time, my travel group on SmackDown, this is our group, myself, Paul Burchill, Bobby Lashley, the boogeyman and Jillian Hall. That was the five people who used to drive around a car. Now, Lisa said I was the dad of the car. I was, let's go. We got to go. Have you ever talked to Jillian Hall? Ask her about the story about the time she tried to order a Frosty from Wendy's and I almost blew a gasket. But that was our crew. Uh, but Paul Burchill, I thought he deserved more from WB. The Ripper was a fantastic gimmick. Uh, it was awesome. He was just a good dude. There's so many people that they missed over the years. They just missed with. And it sucks because I think they they kind of neutered their own business. I mean, they're, they're back on track to a degree now, I guess. Yeah. I don't watch it a whole lot. But there's a lot of guys, man, who I think they had a lot more left on the table with and they just didn't get it. So, And a lot of it in wrestling is timing sometimes, just when, yes. when, when, you, when you show up and who's making the decisions for, for you. For all that matters, man. It's a work sport. I hate to say this word, but work sport run by kind of marks to a degree – 
They have their agenda. You're just a, a, a chess piece. So you, I mean, you could be what I mean. Eventually, if you're good, you'll get a shot. But I could sit here and list twenty guys who you say, "Oh yeah, I forgot about them." Like, how do you blow it with Sean O'Hare? How'd you yeah. blow it with Mark Jindrak? How'd you blow it with Kevin Seven? Luther Ray, there's a lot of guys, man. It's like, oh man, they were so close. Yeah. And it's just, it didn't work. And that's fine because it's wrestling for most of these people. If you're listening to this podcast and you're in the business, wrestling is going to be a, in, in ring wrestling, your career is going to be a lot shorter than you think. I mean, if you live to be 80 years old and you're in the ring for 10 years, that's an eighth of your life, right? I mean, it's like, I don't know. So sometimes it's the most important thing in the world to you, but you just have to take a step back and say there's a lot more than just being a guy who can wrestle. So very good. And finally, when you look back at the entirety of your career, what's your legacy? Uh, I was thinking about that, Phil, because I'm thinking about what I'm probably going to wind up saying at the end of the night on December 3rd. <laughs> what I want is to be remembered as a guy who always tried his best, tried to do my hometown of Tom Silver proud have my family be proud of what I accomplished, a dude who fought and made it despite every conceivable obstacle you could ever have. I overcame that. I showed that you can make the impossible possible. I left the best business in better shape than I found it, which not everybody can always say. But the number one thing that I wish, if and I've had guys say this to me, they, they were like, man, you're the guy I want to be like when I'm done with wrestling. Because I showed that Wrestling sometimes, if you, I mean, we all saw the movie The Wrestler. We've seen these stories. We know the stories. Guys, girls, we don't have to wind up a statistic. The business does not do this to us to a degree. It's personal choices. It's twists and turns. I understand all that. But this business can equip you with a toolbox that you can reach into for the rest of your life. How to talk, how to stand out, how to cut promos, how to get over, how to work a room, just how to work in general. And it, it, it just... I wish more of my wrestling brothers and sisters would realize that life does not end when the bell it rings uh, and, and you can accomplish. I, I mentor a lot of guys post wrestling career. I'm working on something here in Louisville, try to work with some college athletes too. You know, what do they do when the lights are off on Friday after it's over? Right. How do you transition into the real world? That's been the biggest thing. So for me, the legacy of man, you know, Nova was, was good in his time in wrestling. He was an average wrestler. He was decent. But it's what he accomplished afterwards that I wish more people would focus on. Well, congratulations on everything that you've accomplished, Thanks, both in and out of the ring. Uh, it's a real, it's a real pleasure to have you here today uh, for me personally. So, um, and and best of luck with everything you're doing. You got the big show coming up December third, Barnabas Arena, Tom's River, New Jersey. Mike Bucci, thank you so much for joining me today on Under the Ring Pro Wrestling Conversations. I Thanks, really, Bill. really enjoyed this. Thanks to the producer, too, for hopping on at the last minute. My condolences out to the other producer and her, her family. Uh, it was great to have me. Thanks a lot, and uh, I hope to see you guys at the show.